If we take a scientific approach to sexual orientation, then the first question that a scientist is going to ask is that, is sexual orientation primarily influenced by psychological or social factors? That's the nurture argument. Or is there a role for biological and genetic factors? In other words, the nature point of view. In the US right now, our general conversation is whether there is a biological or genetic component at all. That's where we are as a nation. We're not to the point where we want to know what percentage is biological or genetic and what percentage is social or psychological. We're not even that far yet. So what I'm going to do is to try to focus on the information that will give you a sense of where we are, what our understanding is about the biological and genetic factors. One of the very first studies that really started pointing people uh, away from the psychological and social factors and toward the biological is the following. In this study, there were 39 genetic males that were studied. Each one of these males was born with a physical abnormality. That physical abnormality came from a condition known as cloacal extrophy, in which the, the genitalia are very poorly differentiated, or from botched circumcisions. I mean, these were truly botched circumcisions, badly botched. So much so that these children were surgically reassigned at or near the time of birth. For these 39 genetic males, they were raised as females. So all of the cues that they received their whole life was that they were female. They were given dolls to play with. They were dressed as females. They were treated as females. When they became adults, and entered into this study, they were asked a series of questions. And those questions had to do with their identity. Did they feel like they were males or females? And almost 70% said that regardless of all of these social cues that they had received, they felt as if they were males. So the surgery and the social cues were not enough to give them an identity that was separate from that which they had at birth. I want to start by showing you some of the genetic data uh, that are out there. And it was this early study that really said there's something more fundamental than the social cues that we're getting. There's something more than the psychology of that person. And so uh, there, you really can separate these into family studies, into twin and sibling studies, and then I'll just basically touch on a little bit of, of molecular studies. Before I do that, I want to remind everyone what the human genome looks like. We all have 46 chromosomes in 23 pairs, and I have shown you a picture here. There are two pictures. There are two genomes here. One is a male genome, an XY, and one is a female, XX. The top in that shaded area is a male. That is the XY sex chromosome. And the female is at the bottom, the XX sex chromosomes. If you look at chromosomes from a heterosexual person versus a homosexual person, they look exactly the same. They're the same number, the same size, the same shape. There's nothing missing. There's nothing added. There's nothing abnormal about the genome of a heterosexual or a homosexual person. The other thing that we know a lot about is sexual differentiation. Sex itself, whether you get an XX or an XY, is determined at conception. But sexual differentiation 
occurs during gestation, very early on in the eighth to the sixteenth week. Okay, so there is conception that sets XX or XY, and then the differentiation comes early on, much of it completed before the mother may even know that she is expecting. During gestation, what happens is that fetal hormones, and I underline fetal hormones, not maternal hormones, but fetal hormones, act on body tissues. So fetal hormones are turned on during this 8 to 16th week time period. And it's the influence of this hormonal milieu on body tissues, all body tissues, including the brain, including the genitalia, including the entire body, that give rise to male and female characteristics. And we know a lot about this because we have studied this not only in humans, but in animals. So we, we do understand that all of this is occurring between the eighth and 16th week of gestation and that these hormones are coming from the tissues uh, of the fetus itself. Right now there are no ways to do prospective studies. There are no studies that can currently rely on any technique where we can go in and sample the hormones that are present during this time without destroying the fetus. We don't have any good monitoring system. We don't have any markers for that. So we have to try to infer, and, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, how do we infer what went on during this time period? 